Ladies and gentlemen, there's been a miracle. It's a miracle for homeopathy. Really? I'm not, I'm not fooling you. I'm not pulling your leg. It's a real honest God miracle. And I know my miracles. You know, this is an interesting time that we're living in. There's a lot of, been a lot of um, technological, scary technological developments. I don't know if you if you heard about the latest. It's a um, an interface, a, a computer interface with your brain. Now maybe they're making this up. Well, of course they're making it up. I mean that's what technology is: is making things up. <laughs> but um, this thing reads your. The, the, sig the brain signals that are coming out of your brain to your vocal cords and translate, translate that into digital, you know, into octal. I've got a friend who, who is pushing octal to replace decimal. Hey, look who's here. Look who's here. It's my, my friend, my best friend, my only friend, Hudson. Hooray. How are you doing today? Oh, that feels good, doesn't it? He needs a haircut. Right below the eyes. <laughs> right above the eyes. Well, what would I do without Hudson? You know, Hudson's somebody I can give my entire love to. I can just love him. You know. Without any... <laughs> without any uh, attachments... So let's see, where was I before we were so crudely interrupted? Is it time of development? There's like a paradigm, big paradigm shift going on. And this thing about public, kind of public confession, this thing with the Supreme Court nominee, bless his heart, you know, so you got to pray for people like that, that are in that jam. I mean, he's in a, he's really in a personal jam. And he's going through a lot of suffering. But so is the prosecution, if you get what I mean. I mean, I don't want to get too specific about this. I don't have to name names. But it's making me ill. I actually, and I said, well, I had a... Um, little reunion with my uh, high school friends, kids I knew, a couple of people I knew in high school and then an older person that was in high school with us, an older girl, lady, woman. So there was four of us there. But two of them I, I had worked with over the summer, my, our last summer, and so we got to know each other pretty well. I lived with one of them, this one guy for a while. We were in an acting company. And uh, so we were being somebody who we, we spent a lot of time being somebody who we weren't repeatedly. We like got drilled in our heads because we're doing five shows a day, seven days a week, doing melodramas, which is kind of the art, archetypal storytelling, the villain, the hero, the exposer, the uh, fallen woman, and of course, the heroine. Everybody loves the heroine. And we would do these shows in front of an audience of up to 200 people, five times a day in an amusement park. And there was an MC that would stand on stage, and when the bad guy came out on stage, he'd hold up his card and say, boo, and everybody would boo this guy. And cheer for the hero. And I found that these people... We were just kids. We were like 18 years old for the most part, 17, 18 years old. Just graduating from high school. And um, out on our own for the first time. You know, living on our own. And we were living down in a little beach community in Oregon called Lincoln City. So we had to find apartment places for ourselves so we could be in this show. And the show went seven days a week. So it was a pretty heavy set schedule. You get one day off. Work six days a week. Playing this character. I was the exposer. The detective that comes in and shoots the 
villain in the back. <laughs> Chase him through the audience, run him up on stage and shoot him in the back. <laughs> if you're going to die, die on stage, right? But stage is no place for personal confession. Personal confession should be allowed for the bedroom only, or the, um, with the little cabinets, the confessional that they sit in in the Catholic Church, where you confess all, all your sins to some guys then done stuff worse than you could ever dream of doing. Wow! <laughs> so, anyway, we play these characters, and they kind of get it gets drilled into your psyche because you're coming out on stage five times a day saying the same stupid lines and going through the same motions like a robot. And this character gets drilled into your head. I was the exposer. And you know, the detective, the bad guy was the bad guy. The good girl was the good girl. Most, and the, two, the, the good girl and the bad girl, the, fem, the fallen woman and the Heroin grew up never to have children. They played childless women in the play. And the woman, the, the girl that played the woman, <laughs> the girl that played the, the mother, had a family. I mean, she's fairly normal. <laughs> the guy that played the hero married another guy. And the gay marriage is very happy. Very, he was one of the he was one of the guys I was meeting with for lunch. He was the happiest gay guy I've ever known. He was kind of prickly as a kid, and I had him. I shouldn't say I had to. He and I shared a very small trailer house for a while. It was like the odd couple. He was he was always picking up after my mess. I'm a slob. Anyway, I try not to. I'm truly trying not to be. Bear with me. So, and then the girl that played, the other girl that I met for, with, I was meeting with for lunch, played the fallen woman and she never had any children. But good, really good people now, you know. I mean, and me, I became a private detective. I'm not kidding you, I swear this is true. So, there's been a lot of foreshadowing in my life. And this, I got to say, the stage is no place for confession of that time, unless you're really going to get ahead of it. You know what I mean? I mean, forced confessions don't work. A confession has to be voluntary. And to do it in public is excruciating. And all the th people that I was meeting with, uh, my friends, and I've checked that my brother agreed, said, yeah, that's true. And I'm getting the feeling this is widespread, almost, it's almost unanimous that this current news cycle of the Supreme Court nom nomination hearings and the presidency of the United States, the administration, is making people ill. It's actually making people physically sick. Because you can't turn away from it, but at the same time, it's excruciating, it's torture to listen to it. And so we're desperately in need of a guide, of a foundation, something to hold on to during these times. You know what I mean? We need a miracle. And ladies and gentlemen, specifically miracles are happening, especially for homeopathy, which I will get to. What, what do you want? It's him. It's him again. It's me. You agree, don't you? We do need a miracle. A, a real miracle. Yeah. Like a walk. Like go for a walk. Or have something good to eat. Have something tasty to eat. To eat. Yeah. Not be worried about things. Not be unhappy. I just love that dog. I do. I really do. Now he's going to go try to wipe it off. 
I'll give him a kiss and he'll go and try to wipe it off. So rubbing up against the couch and stepping in. Ah! <laughs> so anyway, um, I've seen miracles. I have seen astounding miracles. And you have two haven't you? My greatest miracle the one that really was just foreign is I was in court. I was hauled into court for um, kind of criminal mischief or something like that. I don't want to get into specifics. But I was, I was really concerned. Of, well, maybe I should say something. I was really concerned about the welfare of my children. And I broke into my wife's house. She just moved out. Got a little carried away. Broke into her house to see if the kids were all right and got charged with being an asshole, I guess. Um, charged with breaking and entering and <laughs> criminal mischief or disturbing the peace or something like that. Anyway, they had me up on trial and the, the DA was out for blood. He really, he was red faced pissed. I don't know why it wasn't that big of a deal really, but it, well, it was to me. I mean, I've never been on trial before, never been arrested for anything. Never spent a night in the tank. <laughs> um, and to make a long story short, I fired my attorney there on the spot. When, th when I asked for, I wanted a choice of evil, evils argument. Choice of evils, meaning that I had no other choice but to do what I did, knowing full well that it was wrong. <laughs> like the, the, the ch it was a choice of evils, right? Well, I don't know if you know it. I, don't, I guess I was expecting too much as to ask you if it's right or not. And the um, I told my, my attorney, I said, I want a choice of evil. Well, okay. So he presented to the judge and the judge said, no, you can't have that. I thought, what, the, what kind of justice is this? You can't even pick your own defense. God. So you and I did? I fired my attorney because I said, listen, what happens if we go and present it anyway? He says, well, I'll, I'll yank my bar license. I said, well, okay, then you're fired. I'll do it. I can do it. I can do it. And I did. I fired him on the spot. He goes back, tells the judge. The judge comes out and starts talking to him. And I said, well, excuse me, your honor. You know, this is my show, right? I'm, he, I'm firing my attorney. You have to talk to me. So my attorney buck, buttons up his briefcase, heads for the door. And then, oh my God, I probably ruined this man's career. So, Your Honor, excuse me, but could, could I could I uh, go and thank him for what he's done for me? Because he, he's a good attorney and just a bad situation for us all. The judge says, okay. So I go out in the hall and I said, thank you. There's a guy standing there with, holding some papers and wants to serve me some papers while I'm standing there. I said, it's like, he said, are you John Bennett? Uh, uh, I'm not talking to you. Anyway, so I went back in the, in the courtroom. And uh, I said, Your Honor, I'm now presenting myself to the court sui juris. And the judge looks at me. I said, Siri Juris, let God be my judge. It's an old ecclesiastical legal term of uh, in, invoking the name of God to be your judge, which probably is a big mistake. <laughs> Although, I don't know, they say he's a pretty forgiving guy. I guess. I don't know. Anyway, so, so, I said, so I'd like to remain outside of the bar the court to make this implication that I'm no longer in the venue of the court. The judge says that, Mr. Bennett, um, I need to have you in front of the mic, the microphone. Pretty good answer. I said, well, Your Honor, I can speak up. She says, well, I won't have you bellowing at the mic. Okay, whatever. 
So denied. Request denied. So um, he, he was about to proceed with this. And I swear this is the God's honest truth. I mean, I should have a Bible here. I do have a Bible here. Here it is. This is my grandfather's Bible. Holy Bible. I swear to the God's honest truth. This is the God's honest truth. What I'm telling you is the truth. They say if you're lying, you can't say that. I question that, but that's what they say. If, you say, if, you, if you've been telling a lie, you cannot say I'm telling you the truth. The ego won't let you do it or something like that. I bet I could do it, though. I'm an actor, so actors can do anything. So I, I'm, the next thing that happened after declaring myself in the jurisdiction of God and being kind of physically denied that by the court or objectively denied that, an earthquake hit the building and began to shake the building. And a woman comes bursting through the door. This is the court clerk or something. He says, we've been ordered out of the courthouse. This is in Multnomah County Courthouse. The Nisqually earthquake. Um, I think it was in June. Of, I forget what year it was. About 18 years ago. 14 years ago. And, um, and I looked at him and I said, God has intervened. He said, Mr. Bennett, am I going to have to have you restrained or put in, put in the lockup? I said, well, where are you going to put me? I mean, we've been ordered out of the courthouse. Oh, so he said, well, just be back here at 1.30. I said, okay. So I go out the door. My dad was there, and, and uh, Dr. A Howard Asanoff was there. Howard can attest to all this. My dad's passed away. But we're walking down the hall, and some guy says, you're not going to get away with it uh, ahead of me. Says, I said, who are you? He never did answer that question. I suddenly realized I'd left my coat in the courtroom. So I ran back to the courtroom and tried to get in, and the door was locked. And the uh, judge was coming down the hall with his court clerk, with his clerk. He says, do you need some help? What's going on? And I said, I, I left my coat in there. So he reaches over, and he sticks a key in, his key in the lock and opens the door for me. So I'm breast to breast with him, like he's right here. And I said, thank you. I really appreciate your patience. So, you know, it's always good to show gratitude. And I went and got my coat. And we went to lunch. And the papers had that, that, that the man was trying to serve me turned out to be my divorce papers. So this was turning into a real good day for me. Go back to the courtroom and the judge comes in and he says, Mr. Bennett, I've talked this over with some other my associates. With my you know, with some of the other judges. I don't think he said associates. <laughs> And, you know, one of them could have been a kid I went to high school with, who was the first Oriental judge in uh, the state of Oregon. I wonder if he was talking to Mike. Or I also know, I also went to school with the kid that was the, um, turned out to be the youngest Supreme Court justice in the state of Oregon. And is now the chief justice in the state of Oregon. And the friend I have. My, for another friend I have in high places. I don't I don't pull those kind of strings on. Anyway, so um, since I've talked to these other judges and I didn't tell them anything specifically about your case, but after a lot of consideration, I think I should um, recuse myself from this case. But first reverse but before I do, um, 
reverse your choice of evils, my decision on your choice of evils argument. In other words, you can have that. Now that I'm bailing out, I'm remanding this case, recusing, reverse, reversing, recusing, and remanding this case to, to some other poor, poor soul. So that was an amazing miracle for me. You know, I eventually did go back to trial, and they just kind of let me off the hook with no big deal. And I, you know, I, they gave me a misdemeanor or some court supervision. And uh, the judge said, we can't have any firearms. I said, well, I'm in a gunfight show down in Virginia City. She said, okay, well, you can have it for that. So... I'm going to ask another story, the gunfight show in Virginia City. I'll tell you that story some other time, if you want to hear it. So that was my, one of several things that I would call either amazing coincidences or a miracle. Take it for what you will. And I began to wonder, what's, is there a doctrine that surrounds this kind of stuff? Is there any kind of, I mean... I've had this theory that once you've seen something once, you'll probably, it's a string of something. And it's all connected, right? But if you see something really unusual, it's not really entirely idiomatic. It's not, it's not all out there all alone. It's got, it's got a family. And you see a Bigfoot, he's not the only one. He's got to have a mom and a dad, and he's probably got kids too, right? Well, the same thing is true with miracles, I think. This is my opinion. Now, you've seen one, you, you, you've seen them all. <laughs> and there must have been some note of that. So I began, when I was down in Virginia City living at the, at the Murky Mansion, the Mackey Mansion, doing my Mark Twain show, I got to thinking about these miracles that I was experiencing, you know, a lot of psychic behavior and this kind of stuff. I thought, well, what's the... Is there any, there must be some written creed for this, some kind of doctrine. And by God, it just popped in my head, well, it's the Sermon on the Mount. It's Luke 6, Sermon on the Plain. You know, both expositions of the Christian creed, if you want to call it that. Although I, I, I think calling it Christian kind of dirties the name, considering the people have been running it for the last 2,000 years. So I started studying that. I started studying the, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and the Sermon on the Plain, Luke 6. And this is, to me, this is the doctrine of the miracle, a thaumaturgical doctrine. Thaumaturgical, the Greek word for miracle working, thaumaturgy. It's the, do the doctrine of thaumaturgy, the doctrine of amazement. After he'd spoken, they were amazed. The crowds were amazed. It's a real paradigm shift. Even if you look at this in the terms of secular terms. You, you know what I mean? Secular terms. Just as a forensic, looking at it forensically. It's really an amazing statement. It's a real paradigm shift. It's It's a... Like, what the hell did he just say? He said, give your cloak to somebody if they ask for it. Give me, give me your shirt and then give me your cloak, too. <laughs> yeah, I like your shirt. Here, it's yours. Take my cloak, too. Take my coat. Hat, shoes. <laughs> it's like, what? You've got to be kidding. <laughs> You've got to be kidding. Give me your stuff. It is an anti-materialist creed, is what it is. It's like, you don't need this shit. You can get by on spiritual stuff alone. That's all you need. You don't need, you don't need anything else. It's tough. It's really tough, isn't it? Well, enough of that. Homeopathy has had a big win. The big win for homeopathy.
this is a miracle, the, the homeopathic miracle. You know, homeopathy has gotten such a raft of shit from people over the last 200 years, 200, 2,000 years. <laughs> it's gotten such a raft of shit from, oh, there's nothing in it. You know, this nothing in it statement. And the science, the science that they use for this to prove it theoretically is Avogadro's limit, Avogadro's number, Avogadro's constant. <laughs> You're, he's getting excited because because I'm getting excited. I got him a, bit, a bag of biscuits. I probably I should bring them up here so I can keep them at bay. Here, here. go fetch. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I, I'm sc a scatterbrain, so I'm all over the map all the time. But I get so excited about these things. You could take Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and Luke 6, and rip them out of the Bible and throw, throw the rest away or use it for toilet paper. That's how good it is. I mean, just as a historical document. But it says to me, this is, this is the instructions on basically, on basic thaumaturgy, wonder working. Performing miracles. I believe that. And homeopathy has had one, has had one today. Avogadro's limit states that if you if you dilute something one one part to ten, twenty-three times, you'll end up with not one molecule left in it. And they get this equation from what's called Avogadro's number, Count Amadeo Avogadro. It was this Italian count who came up with the basic atomic theory. This is back in 11, 1811, 1810, he published, which coincidentally was the same year that Hahnemann came out with the organon. The guy that when Avogadro, Count Avogadro, the guy that came up with the theory used to theoretically prove that homeopathy is a hoax, came out with his theory. That, I, don't, I don't know if they even knew each other. I mean, Hahnemann was pretty well read. He might have known about Avogadro, but he was more into chemistry than mathematics. So it's, it's what's been used as the kill shot, supposedly, on homeopathy. Well, there's a problem with it. And the problem is, mole is molecular dissociation. Molecular dissociation is what blows Avogadro out of the, out of the water because the dis dissociation of the molecule, the particle, is basically a phenomenon of hydrogen getting into the lattice work of the of matter and blowing it up. You know, a hydrogen bomb. You know what a hydrogen bomb is? They take a piece of plutonium and they surround it in a bubble of hydrogen and then they implode it. And it's like it's basically like homeopathic succussion. It squeezes all that together and it explodes with this huge shower and shit shower of radiation. Right. Well, that's the same nuclear event that's happening within the within the homeopathic remedy is during the succussion phase between dilutions is it raises 10 kilobars of atomic pressure and pulverizes the molecule into ions, essentially electrons that go out within the hydrogen bond structuring. And, the, and this is fed either by, well, this is where hydrogen comes in, is the hydrogen is like a bridge between the radi radiation and the first material, what well, you might consider the material phase of matter, although it's all material phases. And there's a fifth phase too, by the way, didn't you know? The, in the immediate phase. Anyway, I'll get to that later in some other show. So um, this is what the electron then expands into the next dilution. This expansion keeps going on through subsequent dilutions indefinitely. 
This is called infinite dilution. If you r run in infinite dilution, there's actually a NIST protocol, National Institute of Standards and Technology protocol, for um, infinite dilution. The solvent, the water, is being ionized by the solute, the whatever you're putting in there is material, the stated material, the intended matter is being ionized. Well, this is hard for people to understand or accept, but guess what? I looked up Avogadro's constant on Wikipedia and there in, in, in that article, this top, the guy to get the Nobel Prize for chemistry is considered the father of chemistry. I think it's uh, Ar Arhenis, Arhenis. Van <laughs> I don't know. Look it up. He's in there. Basically says that there's an exception to the to the Avogadro's rule. Now, if you can figure out basically what Avogadro's talking about, essentially, it's a pretty obtuse. I'd like to hear what you think he knows. But what I, what the father of modern chemistry said is that yeah, there's Avogadro's limit, but there's an exception to the rule, and you know what it is. It's molecular dissociation. What I've been talking about all along, it's like, I didn't, I didn't know that. I didn't know that, that they were giving that as a rule. This is something that I came up independently of that. And this is happening repeatedly as I study homeopathy, that these facts converge on things. So I'm going to put, I'm going to put a link to, I'll put a link to the, to the Wikipedia page in case you're too lazy to look it up so you can click on it and read it for yourself. That the exception to Avogadro's rule, the basic skeptic's argument, is molecular dissociation. This expanding electron. This is recognized by the father of chemist, modern chemistry. And another thing, maybe I should put a picture of this in the, in my, the John Bennett Journal so you can go see that. Go see, it's a picture of Linus Pauling, the father of quantum, chem quantum chemistry, the only man to win two Nobel Prizes, 100%, is standing there in this picture holding mo the model, uh, structural models of, the, of H2O bonding in water, which a lot of these skeptics say, well, it's impossible for, it's impossible for water to structure because the, it breaks in a femtosecond. The hydrogen bond breaks in a femtosecond, so water can't structure, and therefore can't take an imprint of the solute. And there's Linus Pauling standing there with models of H bonded structuring. I mean, where do you where do you think these structures? What's the destructures? What does it do? It structures again. Where? With what? As what? Even if it's a femtosecond, it's structuring, but it's destructuring. What the? This is this is pretty funny. Skeptics are saying, well, it can't structure because it only holds for a femtosecond. Well, it's structured for a femtosecond, right? Then what did it do? Restructures as something else? Or maybe it's just vibrating. Maybe these bonds are just vibrating back and forth, breaking and then re restructuring. Maybe what they're picking up on there with the, whatever kind of instrumentation they're using is... The vi is basically just it, it just vibrating back and forth. I don't think it breaks at all, if you ask me. I think they've just seen the bubble going through the hose. Being rattled is all. Anyway, check it out, man. This is the kill shot because he, it basically blows this whole argument up in their face. And Dana Ullman just said that nature, Dana Ullman, the greatest homeopath alive in America, she get the she get the Hahnemann for a million dollars for homeopathy. Huh? Allman reports that Nature magazine now is coming around to homeopathy, doing some tests on Roost Tox, homeopathic poison ivy. I think uh, I think we've turned a page. I think it could be downhill. Now, here for homeopathy. Homeopathy is a wonderful form of medicine. 
It really is. If you don't know anything about homeopathy, get to know it some more. You, it's fascinating. And there's a lot of stuff online that you can pick up on. Clark is online, which is FDA reference, the FDA reference authority on homeopathy. And he's got about a thousand different remedies in there. And he mentions the he uses the word cure over 1,500 times. I think it was 1,532 times. I counted it. The word cure, cured, curing, appears over, over 1,500 times in Clark's Dictionary of the Modern Materia Medica. Check it out. I mean, you know, take off this mask of skepticism and investigate, ask questions. It's fascinating. Well, I don't know how long this has been. I've, I'm way over time. This has been a half an hour of me rattling on. I hope it was worth it for you. I really want to thank you if you've gotten this far for sitting through this and bearing with Hudson and I on a day's excursion. So thank you. It's, you know, it's good to be, to show gratitude. They say people that show gratitude are happier. So if you want to be, if you want to get happier, show more gratitude. Thank you.